Good morning and welcome to our subspecialty round service. I want to congratulate all of you for planning for the weather. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, a, a guest. This is a return international observer, Dr. Akwesi Ahmed from CATH in Ghana. <laughs> Dr. Ahmed has uh, finished a five-month uh, retina fellowship at Tilganga in Nepal. He will now be with us for one month and then he'll um, be working for one full year uh, doing a retina fellowship with our partners at Aravind and then he'll return to be the retina specialist for CAT. So uh, wel welcome. Uh, would, you, would you like to say anything? You don't, you don't have to. All right, very good. We'll, we'll get you at the very end. With that, I'll, I'll turn the time over to Dr. Emmy Hartnett uh, for our retina subspecialty round. Thank you all for coming. I think it's an exciting time in retina and genetics, and so we've uh, kind of have a theme in this grand rounds where we're, we'll have our experts present cases, and then uh, hear from uh, some about some of the genetics from our genetic counselor Emily Spoth, who uh, I hope you all uh, continue to use uh, her expertise. So first, we're going to have Chris Kamansky who's uh, one of our first year fellows, and he's gonna present a case of melanomolytic glaucoma and discussion of uveal melanoma genetics. Chris. So this is an uh, interesting case that I was able to see with Dr. Jacoby. And the history is that the patient came in complaining of floaters. He's a 69-year-old gentleman with a past medical history of diabetes, kidney stones, chronic kidney disease, stage three, who presented complaining of these new onset floaters in his right eye and denied any pain. He had a history of moderate myopia. He had a multifocal lens in his right eye that was positioned in the sulcus due to vitreous loss during surgery. His past medical history, as we talked about, is CKD stage three. When I, I was looking at the chart initially, thinking that was from diabetes, is actually due to severe and chronic nephrolithiasis. His diabetes was well controlled with diet and physical activity. He has hypothyroidism, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. And no family history of cancer. Married, lives at home with his wife. Medications were lisinopril, synthroid, simvastatin, aspirin, and he was allergic to linagliptin. His eye exam: visual acuity was hand motion in the right eye, 2020 in the left eye. His last refraction was actually done before he had cataract surgery in his right eye, and this is his refraction and vision. His pupils were normal, pressure normal, were unable to obtain visual fields in the right eye, but normal in the left eye. On slit life exam, he had a large caliber vessel temporally um, in his conjunctiva. He also had, um, in his anterior chamber, two millimeters of a layered hyphema with three plus pigmented cell. Again, he had the multifocal sulcus lens. On dilated fundus exam in the right eye, he had a dense vitreous hemorrhage. He had no view posteriorly in that eye. The other eye was normal. So at this point, uh, do we have any of the residents here? We have lots of them. Oh, lots of them. Teresa, what's, a, what's your differential for a diabetic with a vitreous hemorrhage? Perfect. Since he doesn't have diabetic retinopathy in this other eye, what other things would you think about? Yeah, so things that cause neovascularization like ocular ischemic syndrome. But um, what's probably most common in someone without diabetic retinopathy? Um, like a So like retinal tear, hemorrhagic, PVD, 69, retinal detachment. Because he didn't have diabetic retinopathy, and this is just kind of the complete differential on vitreous hemorrhage, um, and we won't belabor it too much, but the general categories of the vitreoretinal retinal interface, which is most common at the top. Then there's neovascularization due to retinal vascular disease, which you see the list there. 
You can have a ram. Choroidal is interesting because you can actually get vitreous hemorrhage from choroidal neovascular membranes, um, but also choroidal tumors. And then trauma, which he doesn't have a history of, blood disorders, um, and then some less common things and masquerades at the bottom. So additional testing, we did an ultrasound of the right eye, and the B-scan revealed this choroidal mass measuring 11 and a half by 11 and a half millimeters with a thickness of a little over 11 millimeters. And the notes was medium reflectivity, one, with one plus irregularity, and three plus vascularity. And this is a representative B and diagnostic A scan. So at this point, we have a patient we're diagnosing with choroidal melanoma of the right eye and wanted to recommend an evaluation for brachytherapy with a radioactive plaque and we wanted to perform genetics to give them a prognosis of this tumor and then also get liver enzymes, chest and abdominal imaging. At this point he was re he elected to be referred to Philadelphia where Dr. Shields performed his plaque treatment. So this was this highlighting a classic case of choroidal melanoma and then we were just going to go through a discussion of choroidal melanoma and then of the genetics associated with it. So it's the most common primary malignancy of the globe and the annual incidence is one per 200,000 people. <coughs> you can have a melanotic melanoma like you see here or a classic ciliary body melanoma um, extending underneath the retina and breaking through Brooks membrane causing a vitreous hemorrhage and some pigment dispersion, or a supratemporal, just large choroidal melanoma. The demographics is pretty equal amongst men and women. Now, it's typically a disease of older people. However, the range in this series uh, was anyone from six years old to 100 years old. Um, and it's also a disease primarily of Caucasian people, with about 98% of these in the U.S. being that diagnosed in Caucasians. Interestingly, there, there's an elevated incidence of prior malignancy at 11%, but most of these people do not have a history of prior malignancy. Now, in terms of tumor location, the majority of these are confined to the choroid, and in this series of over 1,000, uh, choroidal melanoma or uveal melanomas, 65% were in the choroid, 15% were in the ciliary body or iris, and then the remainder were undetermined or not listed. So the treatment options for choroidal melanoma um, historically and still sometimes requires surgical resection, which is a nucleation. However, um, <coughs> Many of these eyes can be saved by the use of radiation therapy, most commonly brachytherapy, but also proton beam irradiation at some centers. And so plaque brachytherapy, this is just a cartoon showing generally what, what is done. A pertomia is made. These radioactive seeds are placed by radiation oncology in this metallic plate, which is then sutured to the sclera and left there for about four days, and then removed. And then the pertomia is repaired. So this is what it looks like when a plaque has been sewn onto the sclera. As we can see from the trends in how uveal melanoma has been treated, in the 70s, almost everyone was being enucleated if this was diagnosed. However, through a lot of hard work and then the results of the COM study, it was shown that radiation uh, treatment is actually very effective for choroidal melanoma, and now it's become much more common. So the case continued. So the patient got his plaque and was doing very well under the care, co-managed between Dr. Shields and Dr. Jacoby. Um, but 12 months after the plaque, he presented to the triage clinic at Moran, complaining of pain, photophobia, anterior chamber. He was found to have an anterior chamber cell, a vitreous cell, and ocular hypertension. His right eye was 26, left eye was 10. Um, <coughs> Dr. Harry was able to perform a, a B scan that day. And that revealed excellent tumor regression, so similar basal size that's expected, but the thickness was previously 11.2 millimeters and now it's 5.3 millimeters. And we have a photo from around this time. And we can see this temporal mass uh, with a little bit of overlying vitreous hemorrhage. And it's a little bit hard to see, but in the inferior vitreous, there's some vitreous pigment um, you can kind of see through the eyelashes. Um, those 
scars around the tumor are actually lasered out, performed by Dr. Shields, um, to the non perfuse retina in the hope of preventing neovascular glaucoma. What was interesting is then we, we expected this to probably be neovascular glaucoma and expected to treat with anti VEGF therapy. However, on gonioscopy, there was no neovascularization. There was dense pigment within the angle, as you see in this um, excellent gonio photo. And this raised some concerns for us. Is, is this tumor actually seeding the vitreous and now we're getting infiltration of the angle? Or could this be something else? So we sent these images to Dr. Shields and she decided she wanted to see the patient, saw the patient three days later. We started the patient on Predforte and Timol in the meantime. By the time the patient followed up with Dr. Shields, the pressure had normalized, the eye was feeling comfortable to the patient and he was feeling back to baseline. Um, she assessed this and <coughs> determined that this was likely just from tumor necrosis and that this is pigment being dispersed into the vitreous and then being, uh, uh, ending up into the angle and the trabecular meshwork. But this is something we're going to be watching very carefully over the next few months. Does the patient have translimination defects? In the iris? Because a, a multi, there, there's only really one kind of multifocal you can safely put in the sulcus. Mm -hmm. The rest are all going to be single piece, mm -hmm. and that, that could be complicating the issue with, with us. Absolutely. I think that, that's a great point. Um, I did, I, the patient was dilated when I saw him, and I did not notice translimination defects. But it, it's something I might want to go back and look. Yeah, just look and see if it's a single piece or a three piece. Yeah. If it's a single piece, then... Then that could be a... Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And <clears throat> what we were most concerned with is that... This, this would shows the issue. Sometimes the front of the eye forgets there's a back of the eye, and the back <laughs> of the eye forgets there's a front of the eye. Absolutely. It's just a clear window, right? Um, so we really want to focus on that in choroidal melanoma, we're treating more than just the eye, and we're treating the patient. And that's because this is a disease with significant mortality. Despite advancements in the treatment of choroidal melanoma, the uh, mortality has been about 20% over five years, and that hasn't changed over the last 40 years. And as you talked about, there's a, the COM study, which showed that radioactive therapy was safe and effective. And this is the main result from that, which this is death from any cause of the brachytherapy group versus the nucleation group of medium-sized uh, tumors. You can see through 12 years, there's no difference in uh, survival. This is also true if you look at the results looking at only metastases, metastases-free survival. But there's also a lot of interesting, interesting data that was uh, gained in the study. That there are things that will put patients at risk for uh, mortality and metastases. And two of the biggest things we identified in this study was age. So if patients were over the age of 60, they're more likely to, more likely to um, die from any cause, but they're also more likely to develop metastases. Um, and if the tumor had a greater mean basal diameter of 11 millimeters. So after the completion of comms, there is a number of people who looked at a lot of these risk factors to come up with predictors of metastatic disease, so hopefully we can identify these high-risk patients and start learning of ways to help hopefully treat them. And this was mostly done looking at nucleated eyes, and they would calculate the largest basal tumor diameter, the presence of different um, histologic uh, results like closed loops, epithelial cellularity, the mitotic rate, and then whether or not there was mitotic spread. And this could be put into essentially a risk calculator that would hopefully predict how likely metastases would be to happen. But what became clear to the ocular oncologist is that this wasn't very good at doing that. And so the next step in trying to figure out uveal melanoma metastasis metastatic risk, it was really to focus on genetics and how genetics could help us figure this out. There are two real main schools of thought, and that was chromosomal analysis, so DNA analysis, which is led in Philadelphia, and then gene expression profiling, which is mRNA analysis, which has really uh, been uh, at the forefront, or been led by the group down in Miami. And so we'll talk about 
each of these approaches. So there's some chromosomal changes that really have been linked to metastatic disease and melanoma, and I'll talk about two of them. There really are three chromosomes involved. Um, chromosome three is probably <coughs> one of the most important predictors of met metastatic disease. And this is important to note, this is the genetics of the tumor. This is not the patient. This is the tumor's genetics. Um, and if you have a normal chromosome three, you have relatively <coughs> low incidence of metastases, metastases-free survival. However, if you lose one of your chromosome three, so you have monosomy, monosomy of chromosome three, there's high, uh, high risk of metastatic disease. There's a similar story, but somewhat flipped, for chromosome 8Q in that if you gain chromosome 8Q, you're having this increased risk of uh, a metastatic disease. And what this study was looking at is looking at some of those basic characteristics of the tumor that you can get from ultrasound or from the biopsy, and then looking at um, chromosomes 3 and chromosome 8Q. <coughs> and what I want to show is the, these, the hazard ratios. Um, and what you can see is that the hazard ratios are elevated for some of these characteristics that have been shown in other studies to predict metastatic disease. But when you look at the magnitude of the hazard ratio, these chromosomal changes are much, much more uh, important to predicting metastatic disease. <coughs> and there's a really a similar story that's told when looking at gene expression profiles and metastatic risk. This is Dr. Harvard <coughs> in South Florida. He had two major studies that looked at this that concept of just breaking down tumors into either class one tumors, low risk tumors for metastatic disease, and class two tumors, which would be high risk for metastatic disease. And the initial study was only 26 patients, and uh, they actually identified 3,000 genes that were linked to risk of metas metastasis. And it's a busy slide, but when you uh, <coughs> look in the molecular class, which is the upper right, you can see that class two tumors, as determined by these 3,000 genes, was, had a much higher incidence of metastatic disease and in the small sample size, a lot of the other things that were known to affect it weren't, they were able to term, determine that. And then some of the things that shouldn't affect it, like gender, uh, there was no, no effect. This was then followed up eight years later in a, a much more detailed study looking at 459 patients. And to make this a more achievable test, uh, they truncated it from 3,000 genes to 12 genes and looked at um, the gene expression of those. And they confirm some of the things we know, that age has an increased risk of metastatic disease, the ciliary bodies involved, it's an increased risk, a bigger tumor has an increased risk. But when you get down to the bottom two graphs, you really see that if you have monosomy three, absolutely that increases your risk of metastatic disease. But even more so than that, they would argue, um, this class two tumor as determined by these 12 genes has an increased risk of metastatic disease. <clears throat> Just to talk about one of the more recent <coughs> findings that uh, a lot of people are talking about is this BAP1 mutation. We've already talked a lot about chromosome three. Well, on chromosome three is this BAP1 gene. And what's been found is that this is uh, very often in almost all metastatic or uveal melanoma cases that there is loss of expression of this. And so whether that's because you have a chromosomal deletion or you get somatic mutations, um, if you ha are not expressing that one, you have a very high likelihood of developing metastatic disease. So the thought is maybe we should just test directly for BAP1, but that's, that's still being debated. So our patient was in Philadelphia, so they got the chromosomal studies. And this is essentially the breakdown of the main findings of those chromosomal studies. So two of the chromosomal changes in this patient gave them elevated risk. Dr. Shields published just a few years ago essentially a giant table that you can go through the matrix and find where your patient is based on all these uh, chromosomal changes. And if, what they found is that or that you can look up is this patient has a five-year risk of metastases of about 33%, which is very high. And now we have to consider if we want to refer him to some of the clinical trials that are looking at prophylactic therapy. 
to try to prevent uh, metastatic disease. But look at the huge odds ratio on that, though. Yep. You've got to be very careful of telling people, because, I mean, the, the spread on that, is your, or your standard deviation, we want to call it, is just huge. Is massive. So the, the reason is, to, they're out of the 1,059 patients with uveal melanoma that they did this study with, only six had this specific breakdown. Precisely. And so how predictive well, is that? A single I'm patient sure. who is dramatically right. different is going to dramatically change that, and that's, what, that's yeah. why we often look at these, these average ratios, and we get, when the spread is huge, let's be a little bit cautious about Absolutely. acting to, with patients like this is deterministic. And I, I completely agree. And it, it's, especially since the treatments that are being looked at as prophylactic therapy are, are not benign. There, there are certainly risks associated with it. So we have this really interesting patient with melanomalytic glaucoma, which we'll be following, and hopefully will do well with topical therapy. And um, I think it was this, it was one interesting case we got to learn about melanomalytic glaucoma, that hopefully this is either chafing and, and UGG syndrome, or um, this is this pigment being dispersed from the tumor, or um, and hopefully he remains metastasis free. Uh, here are my references, and at this point I'd like to open it up uh, for further discussion about the genetics. And, yeah, so I'd like to introduce Emily Spolt, who's our genetic counselor, and she can talk a little bit about her service. That was a terrific presentation. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, I think my role today is to be the official genetic peanut gallery for these <laughs> cases, but in general what I do here is I see folks with either a uh, suspicion of or confirmed um, genetic condition, be that an inherited retinal dystrophy, kind of runs the gamut. Um, yeah, that's mostly what I do. <laughs> For this case, um, if you noticed on the BAP1 slide, there's a subsection of folks that have an identified germline BAP1 mutation. Um, so this is always interesting. Uh, BAP1 is one, so this is essentially a hereditary predisposition to uveal melanoma as well as uh, malignant mesothelioma. Uh, clear cell renal cancer, cutaneous melanoma. Um, so worthwhile, I think, if you have a uveal melanoma patient to just ask about family history, um, because this is one of these dominant tumor suppressor to hit hypothesis predisposition. So I'll be quick, that's all. <laughs> well, and, and please, Emily does a lot of different, uh, helps with a, a lot of uh, diagnoses as well as management of patients, so you can co consult her. Okay, thank you. Dr. Harry? No.